what sorts of signatures would we see that we think are natural and might be actually signs of some intelligent behavior? Trying to extrapolate forward is a bit of a dangerous game. I've gotten a little bit of pushback from the community about this one, actually. I, I'm in the camp that fast radio bursts are probably some sort of natural phenomenon and not a techno signature. means that we can use techniques that we know from archaeology. It means that we can actually do chemical tests and biological tests. It's September. 2019, and this is the WOW Signal Podcast, episode 39, the nine axes of merit for techno-signature searches with Sophia Sheikh. For more information, please visit wowsignalpodcast.com. Now, yes, it has been well more than a year since the last full episode of The Wow Signal. But rather than boring you with apologies and excuses, I will just say, let's get on with this. There's a lot to cover. We are way behind and there are new people on the scene. And one of them is PhD candidate Sophia Sheikh at Penn State. And Sophia will be telling us about her recent paper on Archive called The Nine Axes of Merit for Technosignature Searches. Now, what I'm going to recommend that you do is pause this podcast and go download the paper. The, the link is at wowsignalpodcast.com. should be near the top if, uh, if or find episode 39, and it will be there. Grab the P PDF and print it out or bring it up on your screen while you're listening, because it's just really too much for any one brain to absorb at once. It's all written down there. And the paper is very readable and very easy to understand for the lay person. The only thing that makes it different from just an article is there's lots of references, which in my mind are a good addition to what you would get in an article in a magazine. However, some of you are probably in the car right now and can't look at a paper or a screen, so I'll just read you the abstract to get you sort of primed for this. Now, remember what we're talking about as a techno signature is something that in SETI we've always looked for, which is essentially an observation of some sort that is more likely to be the result of some kind of technological capability than it is of a natural process. We're going to get way more into that here in this discussion in just a few minutes. Let me read the abstract to you then, since you're in the car. The diverse methodologies and myriad orthogonal proposals for the best techno signatures to search for in SETI can make it difficult to develop an effective and balanced search strategy, especially from a funding perspective. Here I propose a framework to compare the relative advantages and disadvantages of various proposed techno signatures based on nine axes of merit. This framework was first developed at the NASA Techno Signatures Workshop 
in Houston in 2018 and published in that report. I give the definition and rationale behind the nine axes, as well as the history of each axis in the SETI and technosignature literature. These axes are then applied to three example classes of technosignature searches as an illustration of their use. An open source software tool is available to allow technosignature researchers to make their own version of the figure. Sophia Sheikh is a third-year graduate student at the Pennsylvania State University working with Dr. Jason Wright. She did her undergraduate work at the University of California, Berkeley, where she became involved with the Breakthrough Listen initiative. Her work incorporates both theoretical approaches to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and observational radio searches for technosignatures. She intends to be the first woman to complete a SETI PhD thesis. Sophia Sheikh, welcome to the WOW Signal. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay. Uh, now, we're here to talk about your paper that appeared on Archive, I think, back in, on, well, it says August 8th on mine. Uh, I think that's the latest revision. Uh, but the uh, title is Nine Axes of Merit for Technosignature Searches. My audience has already heard the abstract. Let's first talk about how this paper got started and what made you think of it and wh why you wanted to do it. Sure. So I have to give credit where credit is due. And uh, this actually came about after seeing a variety of talks at a workshop in Houston last year. NASA put on a workshop for technosignature searches, and it's the first SETI workshop that they'd put on in decades. So that was a pretty important event and I was really honored to be there. And at that workshop, one thing that struck me was that everyone was starting their talks in the introduction with their idea for why their search or their project was so important. And some of them overlapped and some of them were different. And the one that stood out to me in particular was by Adam Frank. And he had this Venn diagram where he said, the ultimate ideal techno signature search would be something that we can detect, of course, but is also not ambiguous. Like if we see it, we know for sure it's some technology. And that got me thinking, well, are there other things you might want to include there? Because if you have this perfect search, but it costs a trillion dollars, that's not useful to anyone. And so... I started discussing with some of the other attendees at this conference and after a while just started writing down in my notebook like lists of things that people were saying that they thought would be most important and combined things, narrowed it down, and that was kind of the start for this paper. The paper lists nine axes of merit. First of all, what, what, let's tell, tell me what you, what you mean by an axis of merit. I think you kind, of, you kind of just did tell us that, but yeah, a little more detail. <laughs> sure. The The idea behind it is just like, uh, I used access because a lot of these parameters are linear. So on one side, like cost is one of them. So let's use that as an example. You have things that are really, really cheap. And on the other side, you have things that are really, really expensive. And so, of course, you want to prioritize things that can be done cheaply. Uh, and so there's sort of already a nice linear value scale there from you bad on one side to good on the other. Like, you want things that are cheap and not things that are expensive. And for every criteria that was suggested and eventually ended up in this framework, they had similar things where you want something that is detectable, not non-detectable. And so the axis of merit idea is just a way to say, here are different ways that we can rank searches. And you one search might score well in some of the, some of the axes, uh, some dimensions, but score poorly on others. And we want to incorporate all of that into one figure. Uh, and figure of merit is kind of a... Uh, common phrase in the literature. So it's sort of a riff on that as well. 
Okay. So let's just go into them. And uh, now, Pete, I, I should point out to my listeners that this paper is very readable. There's not a single equation in it. Uh, there's <laughs> lots of pictures. Uh, so uh, you can read this for yourself. So I'm not going to ask you to just read the paper to us, but can you give us a quick summary and then we'll we'll go in a little bit more depth into some of the examples that you you had. Now we start starts with observational capability. Yes. So the first couple axes are things that are more logistical than anything else than scientific. Right. So that first one is just do we have an instrument or a detector that can be used for the search? And if we don't, how much like effort would have to be put in? How many years in the future will it take? for that capability to be open to us. Got it. Okay. Now this one, next one should be obvious, but it took two paragraphs in the paper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> cost. Yes. And I've sort of mentioned that uh, already in that primarily it's what you would expect, expensive versus cheap searches. But it's kind of interesting because that's the main axis via which SETI searches have been scored on in the past because of the lack of funding. So it's been highly prioritized already, which is kind of interesting. And cost doesn't just mean financial cost, but it also includes like how much observing time will you need? How many people do you need working on this? Uh, if you need effort from a grad student, for example, uh, how much of their time might be taken up by this project that they're not contributing to other things? Right. Makes sense. And of course, that could range from very, very cheap to outrageously expensive, like time on JWST, JWST or some other uh, big marquee instrument. Let's uh, talk about the next one, which I think is, well, the public probably aren't aware of this one, but it's important, ancillary benefits. Right. So this one is uh, one of the ones that Freeman Dyson highlights as extremely important. And... Ancillary benefits just means if you do a search for a techno signature and you don't find a techno signature, how much good science did you or could you have gotten out of that? And so this is could be benefits in you find something interesting, or it could be benefits in you developed a new method or developed a new instrument that can be used for other science. Uh, so we don't want our SETI to be happening in a vacuum. And... I think that access is very important and sometimes overlooked. Another one that's that I think is, you know, I think it's obvious, but maybe not so much as detectability. Yes. Uh, detectability is uh, basically an access that quantifies the signal to noise. Like if you had the ideal situation where this techno signature was being produced, would it be extremely subtle? if you observed it with whatever in instruments you have chosen in the previous axes, or would it be like stand out like a beacon? Uh, and that one ties in a lot with the previous axes. Like the better your telescope is or the more time you have, the better to your signal to noise is going to get. Right. Uh, but it, it kind of stands on its own as well, becoming more of a scientific question. Right. Now this is one that, you know, prob probably I would not have thought of right away, but uh, it it, ma it makes perfect sense when you read it. That's duration. Yes. So duration can mean a couple different things. It's the amount of time that a signature would be detectable for. And this is similar to the lifetime of the extraterrestrial intelligence that's sending the signal out intentionally or unintentionally. But there are certainly signatures that can outlast their host intelligences. So how often is the signal on and how long will the signal be on for is what's incorporated in that duration axis. Right. And clearly that's a, a merit if it's since you don't know when you're going to be looking. Right? Uh, Absolutely. And now that's not when we're talking about duration, talking about basically long-term duration, right? And not just for example, if there was a radio beacon that might be on the Earth for 10 minutes, but then it's going to come off and come back on the Earth for thousands of years, eventually you'd have to rate that as a high duration. 
signal. Yes. So you have to incorporate both the total length of time, but also the duty cycle. How long is it off compared to how long it's on and what are those right. time scales? Yeah. Um, makes sense to me. Ambiguity. Uh, ambiguity is a fun one because I think it's one of the axes on which you can make a very strong argument for techno signatures over traditional biosignatures. Uh, so by ambiguity, I mean, if you do see the signature you're looking for, how sure are you that it's created by technology and not by something totally natural? Um, say a pulsar, for example, in the radio. And this is something that biosignature searches struggle with a lot because many of the signatures we're familiar with from Earth life, say atmospheric oxygen, can also be produced on exoplanets that don't have any life at all. So if you even if you saw atmospheric oxygen, you couldn't be sure that life is what's generating it without other information. Right. Okay. Now this now this next one, um, I have to admit, I, I struggle with this a little bit, although I think it does make sense when you think about it, which is uh, extrapolation. Yes. I have gotten a little bit of pushback from the community about this one, actually. Um, extrapolation... The way that I define it is, how far do you have to go in Earth's future for humanity to be able to produce that techno signature? For things like radio beacons, we could do that now, mm -hmm. and in some cases, and we, many and we do, do occasionally. that now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but something like a Dyson sphere is far outside of our current capabilities. Right. And there are some interesting trade-offs there because the further you extrapolate into the future the more likely we can get something that's detectable at astronomical distances, and that's good. But also, the further you extrapolate, the further you're getting from technologies we've actually developed. So even if you can theorize a way it might be done, there could be technological challenges that we have no idea about because we haven't gotten there yet. And trying to extrapolate forward when we've really only had about a couple thousand years of recorded human history, maybe 10,000, 20,000, is a bit of a dangerous game, and you don't want to accidentally make assumptions that you aren't sure are going to hold. Right, so the less extrapolation, the better, is what this axis of merit telling us, right? Yes, um, with the caveat that things like megastructures will score well on other axes, like detectability, because sure. they're huge. Um, but we should penalize them a little bit, because... At present, we have no idea how we as humanity, even if we all got together right now, would build something like that. Right. And yeah. inevitability. This is one that <laughs> that could get into lots of uh, arguments over Vera on. T tell me about inevitability. Yeah. Inevitability is, for most signatures, pretty hard to quantify. And one way to think about it is if you had a bunch of different intelligences throughout the universe of the galaxy... How many of them, if you just looked at them with whatever instrument, would be emitting that techno signature you're looking for? Uh, is it something that would require a very specific circumstance? Or is it something all of them would be doing? And that gets hard to quantify because anytime you start playing games with thinking about the sociology and behavior of extraterrestrial intelligences, you're wandering out of scientific territory. Sure. Uh, but if you can think of something that every intelligent civilization would have, then you might want to prefer looking for that. And so anything that's an inevitable consequence of growth or of fundamental physics uh, or logical, con logically consistent or a logical thing to do, although again, that gets into motivation, uh, would be scored more highly on this axis. Okay, makes sense. And uh, the final one is information. Yes, that's a fun one. Uh, information just refers to if we do make a detection and let's say it's unambiguous and we know that this is a techno signature, if we turn all of Earth's resources onto it and we get very excited and we try and observe as much as we can, how much information will we be able to get out of that signature? If even with all of Earth's resources, we can still only say like, yep, there's something there. We don't want to know what it's for. We don't know who it is, we just know it's there. That is not quite as interesting as being able to tell something about the signature. 
for example, having a physical artifact to examine or getting a message with information content. Right. Okay. So that's all the nine axes. Now, I, listeners, again, you might want to pick up the, the PDF and follow along because that's a lot of nine things is more than I can hold in short term <laughs> memory. You next give three examples and you have a little chart for each one that you made. By the way, I thought it was really cool. The code for making these charts is on GitHub, and anybody who wants can can make their own. And it will look just the same as these, except it will have different scores for whatever whatever your favorite SETI project is. These are all really good examples, too. Uh, you picked radio and optical communication, waste heat from megastructures, and solar system artifacts. Those are three, definitely my three favorite areas. To sum up, basically, radio is great because we have the observing capability and we can, depending on how, you know, you need big sensitive telescopes, but so the cost is kind of mediocre and the information is pretty good if you, if you can't get a real signal, but maybe not so good. So I'm sorry, I'm trying to do this mental exercise going through this with you. Duration, we don't know. I mean, it's possible, right, that, that a civilization may only use radio for some short fraction of their, their existence and then even not even remember how to do it. At some point, you know, but the ambiguity is great, right? The, the lack of ambiguity <laughs> is great. Okay. Now, the fact that, that, uh, and duration is something that uh, may be a little controversial, right? I mean, we, we just talked about the fact that a civilization might stop sending radio waves unless they really want to communicate with a less sophisticated civilization, right? Th then they might. Dig out the old transmitter in the in the closet and hook it up, uh, just to because they can do that cheaply and easily, and because we we would we would know what that what what that if they're communicating with dark matter or some other thing that we have no idea how to do right we we would probably never see their signal, uh, right? But uh, you know that the the other thing I that worry about with duration is. There are so many stars out there, and if you got a powerful transmitter, you got you can't spend much time on any one candidate. So your duty cycle is going to be low. And so I I don't know it, it it's something somebody can move this slider back and forth quite a bit depending on their assumptions, right? Yes. Uh, explain briefly why the ambiguity is so low for a radio search. Yeah, um, my background is in Radio SETI, so uh, this is one of the axes I like talking about in this context. Uh, Radio SETI, I mean, one of the main reasons it became the main method that we use is because of it, how well it scores on this ambiguity axis. And if you want to send a signal out into the universe and you want to say, hey, this is something made by technology, there are two ways you can do it. You can either compress it a lot in frequency, or you can compress it a lot in time. And just the way natural processes work, there's a limit to how narrow a signal can be in frequency if it's produced by something natural. Mm -hmm. And the narrowest you can get uh, are generally uh, lines produced by masers. So in radio wavelengths, if this means anything to anyone, you're you're still on like hundreds of kilohertz. Whereas we, with technology right now, can produce signals on the order of hertz wide. So right. thousands of times narrower. So if we see anything like that coming from space, we have no natural explanation of any object in space that can do that. And this section is radio and optical communication because uh, in a kind of nice symmetry that arises from physics, you can do the same thing with time. So. Uh, stars and other emitters in the universe have some kind of natural time scale on which you expect photons to arrive from them. And with lasers, we're capable of sending far more photons in a short amount of time than natural sources will produce. So if we see these like tiny, really bright bursts in the optical, suddenly that's very suspicious because we don't know of any objects that are going to do that. Well, since you're a radio SETI expert, uh, I thought this might be a good point to ask you why you don't think fast radio bursts are a good techno signature or maybe you do i'm in the camp that 
fast radio bursts are probably some sort of natural phenomenon and not a techno signature for a couple reasons. One is that we're pretty sure they are extra galactic. We have not uh, gotten precise locations on too many yet, except the repeater. But the fact that they're coming from other galaxies and the fact that we're seeing them from many other galaxies, to me, would be a little strange for the SETI explanation, um, because they require so much power. And for something that produces so much power to be so common, that that would strike me as odd if it was a bunch of totally unrelated intelligences. And that's a field that's still developing, and I, I've dipped my toes into, but haven't explored too much yet. But from what I've seen, uh, natural explanations with something to do with supermassive black holes and AGNs and stuff at the center of galaxies makes more sense to me. Right, yeah. I got the same opinion from uh, Andrew Simeon uh, when we <laughs> talked to him about that. Let's move on to waste heat. Waste heat has very different scores from radio and optical. Let's just concentrate on the differences, for example. What about uh, waste heat is very low on cost. Why is that? Uh, that has to do with the fact that waste heat searches can be done with archives that we already have from other astronomical searches that we're looking for different things. So the idea behind waste heat is no matter what you're doing, if you construct something big enough, it has to give off heat in a black body, because everything does. And if you look in the infrared, so look at the heat, you're going to see a spike if you look at something that's giant and emitting heat. The nice thing about the infrared is it's also how we map out a lot of other objects in the gal galaxy, like where the dust is, where our star-forming regions, uh, where our cooler stars and brown dwarfs, all of these things emit infrared. And so for other reasons, astronomers have already mapped the sky at these wavelengths. So instead of having to go to a telescope and take a bunch of new data, you can just ask for access to an archive uh, and then go through all of that archival data looking for things that are different instead of looking for what you were expecting in the first place. All right. Now, uh, it also scores really poorly on ambiguity. <laughs> Yeah, that's... For the reason, I think you just explained a... why. That... <laughs> right. Um, unfortunately, I mean, black bodies are nice. They're kind of a fundamental thing that we see from anything that has a temperature in the universe. But because of that, anything that is at the same temperature that you expect from your Dyson sphere or megastructure that's giving off waste heat will also show up. So... If you have dust at 300 Kelvin and you're looking for Dyson spheres at 300 Kelvin, those are going to look the same. And if you're doing a search with an algorithm, your algorithm's going to flag them both. And being able to differentiate is possible, but the couple searches that have been done have shown that it's pretty difficult. The uh, Another thing that um, you've already explained observing capability and cost are good for this because we, we, we use infrared telescopes to map the universe. Uh, there are some new infrared telescopes that are kind of on the horizon. Hopefully, we'll someday launch. W first is uh, the first one I'm thinking of, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You think that how, how much will that expand our ability to do that sort of search? Right. Uh, I actually don't have a good answer to that one. Uh, infrared is not my specialty, although funnily enough, my advisor has done one of these searches, so I'm sure he would have an answer. Okay. But as far as archival searches go in general... The more data you have and the more that it is publicly available and usable by the astronomical community, the better it's going to be for these. Right. So it can only it can only go up from here. Yes, I've spent a little time poking through some of the WISE catalog. That's really interesting. All kinds of things out there. Okay, let's move on to solar system artifact. This is probably the most fun one, I think. Uh, but it's also really difficult to search the whole solar system. Uh, let's see. We, we've, we have close-up photographs of a handful of asteroids and maybe one comet. By handful, I don't mean a big handful either, just like a few asteroids that have we've gotten close enough to see small things on. And we have been on the surface of Mars. So we've we've seen a, a tiny fraction of the surface of Mars. Sorry, but no artifacts. As much as we'd like to be able to claim that. This one has one category where it really excels, which is, uh, I'll let you explain. <laughs> So that access is information. Right. 
because this is the only category of SETI searches that would let us, once we've made a detection, go and get the physical artifact or signature and go and explore it in situ. So that means that we can use techniques that we know from archaeology. It means that we can actually do chemical tests and biological tests and all of these things that we could never do with any other remote signals. And solar system artifact searches get a lot of flack <laughs> in the community uh, because they sound very sci-fi and a lot of the literature is a little, a little shaky, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's a real benefit, this ability to go and actually search it out and look at things on meter scales and then down to you know, centimeter, millimeter, whatever, if we actually get our hands on an object. And I think that shouldn't be ignored as a possibility I, I and agree. a reason these searches I mean, I mean, there's a lot of laughter around the subject because of people, of the things like the face on Mars and yes. or, you know, bases <laughs> on the moon, that sort of thing. But it's, that shouldn't, that shouldn't rule out this important thing. Plus, we have the solar system. We can search it. <laughs> It may take a while, but we're you know we're we can we can do that. Of course, as you point out here, the inevitability is is poor. We we can't figure out why someone would come here uh, <laughs> and and leave their trash, <laughs> unless that's why they come here just leave their trash. But uh, yeah, it, and it, it that could have it could have been what hundreds of millions of billions of years ago, right? That, yeah, uh, and it might have only been one visit, and it might have been just very brief it it's a uh, it's fascinating to, to speculate about what that could be uh, i wish we had more data we have zero <laughs> at this point it's our fault for not doing enough solar system exploration well there's something you pointed out here that uh i didn't mention but you mentioned dyson's first law of seti which uh yeah you, you did kind of mention that actually well well uh i may discuss that briefly in the epilogue but thanks for bringing it up to me because i had not I'd kind of heard that, but I didn't really know it was due to Dyson. And you, you also probably have heard the, uh, I'm not sure who coined the phrase, but it's, and I don't know if it's true or not, but they said any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from <laughs> nature. Yes. I'm going to, I'm pretty sure that is attributable to Paul Davies, but I could I could be, it may come from somewhere before that, but that, he's where I heard it first. Um, and when I was first thinking about axes and trying to categorize SETI searches, uh, I thought about this a lot as a category of nature plus. What sorts of signatures would we see that we think are natural and might be actually signs of some intelligent behavior? Or, even more fun, what things look like natural objects ex acting in a way that we have no explanation for. Um, so, Shabilsky's star is a fun oh, object yes, yes. that uh, kind of falls in that category, where we have a model of how the universe is supposed to work, and then we have an object that looks natural, but is not following like that model. So, right. this mostly fits in... Uh, depending on how advanced the technology is, this could be the ambiguity axis. Right. Um, if our model is really wrong and all supernova are caused by intelligent beings, then to us right now, it's extremely ambiguous. We'd never be able to tell. So I think it kind of fits in in that axis, but it's a really interesting discussion yeah. that kind of happens orthogonal to this sort of uh, figure of merit analysis that I'm doing. Right now, I'm going to get to uh, <clears throat> Sam Lichtenstein's questions. Well, you've already kind of talked about how the different types of searches compare. You want to know if there was any proposed searches uh, that stand out. Well, yeah, I think you've just talked about a couple of them. Uh, I mean, there, at least the optical radio and the and the waste heat has been underway, and there's been some work done on that. Um, is there any, are there any others that you, that you know of that you think have particularly high scores on some of these axes? So I'll, I'll talk about one that, uh, I'd like to follow up on at some point, which is 
for the data we do have in the solar system, a lot of it has not been analyzed with anomaly detection algorithms. So, for example, we have a ton of really high resolution images of the moon now from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And one thing that I would like to do is to go through those images and just have an algorithm flag whenever it sees something weird. This has never actually been done in any systematic way for that data. Hmm. Same thing with surface of Mars. And the nice thing about that is it's archival, so that data already exists. Uh, the tricky thing is a lot of these machine learning based algorithms are still in development and can be quite complicated to implement. But uh, that's one I'm pretty excited about because I want more systematic searches of the solar system, especially if we can do it cheaply, which is not always true for solar system science. Right. Yeah, well, with the way the computing power is going and AI is getting easier to implement, it, it's uh, that could very well happen. Uh, the image, uh, NASA would be happy to share the images with you. <laughs> That's not a, not a problem. Okay, uh, if you were the empress of the world, how how would you use the nine axis framework to prioritize projects? <laughs> I made it, but I will say it's tricky. Um... Because one thing I've thought a lot about is how to quantify this. Because, I mean, I'm a scientist. That's what we do, right? If I can right. find some way to objectively assign scores. Unfortunately, and I talk about this a little bit in the paper, that's hard to do because which axes are the most important is just going to depend on your priors. And your priors are just going to depend on exactly what projects have you done in the past and what do you personally think about the frequency of ETI in the universe and all of these things that can't really be quantified. But I would like to see this become a way that ideally funding agencies, if funding agencies ever get back in the SETI game, kind of use to think about projects in this more holistic way. Um, because it's very easy to talk to someone and they'll tell you, not in uh, the Axis framework, but they'll tell you like how their project does well. But it's also important to think about where the blind spots are for every project. And I think that's one thing that I'm excited to see this framework be used for, is to have this honest discussion of like, this search is really well in this regard, but it doesn't do well in this regard. And using that as motivation to use breadth instead of depth in our portfolio of searches mm -hmm. uh, to try to cover for the blind spots of other searches. Um, I, I would like to see that become a more common conversation and see how totally different approaches can work together by covering parts of parameter space that other ones are missing. Yeah, well, now, Sam's, this last question for Sam is rather complicated. I'm going to try. Uh, he's a mathematician. He He's capable of probably keeping more things in short-term memory than I am. He, he's asking about, I think, basically applying these axes, at least the, the uh, the what he calls the uh, the non the five non pragmatic axes, it's not so much cost or you know mm -hmm. uh, so on. I know I don't know exactly how he wants to do it, and he did he didn't provide a lot of detail, but uh, I can kind of understand. You know, he, sa he says uh, we have non trivial priors about the Drake equation, which seems could usefully inform a qualitative comparison of two technic signature searches in ambiguous cases. For example, suppose method A is better than B along the duration and ambiguity axes, but worse along the extrapolation and inevitability factors, and they are equal along other dimensions. It might be that A is unambiguously better than B when one takes into account which regions of Drake equation and parameter space are actually plausible. Uh, might be, might not be. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a speculation. I wonder if you had any thoughts about that. Well... One thing that I have been thinking about, and this kind of ties into the previous response, is how to make this more quantifiable. And I hadn't thought of it so much in terms of interplay with the Drake equation. But one axis I've thought about this a lot for is ambiguity. Because there are methods you can use to nail down a quantitative model of what your ambiguity is going to be. Um, and so that requires simulating the techno signature and then simulate the thing that looks like the techno signature and then throw that fake data through your pipeline and see how well you do on the other end classifying which is which. And if you do this, so it's kind of like injection testing, but with a lot more simulated data, 
then you can actually get a percentage of the time and say, like, if we find four of these and we know 25% of the time we catch a techno signature, then that gives you some idea of how many cases you'll have to observe before you can be sure one of them is a techno signature. So that is kind of a loose and scrappy explanation of it. Um, but Sarah Walker thinks a lot about these sorts of things. And I had an interesting discussion with her about this. And so I think with a lot of work, you can start nailing down more quantitative values for some of these science axes. But it takes so much work per techno signature that it's not really viable to do for everything. It's a you know, multiple research papers in itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in that way, if you start incorporating prior information, doing simulations, there are ways that you can objectively say method A is going to be better than method B. But in order to get there, it's a lot of work. And probably if you're on a committee trying to decide which one to fund, that's not where you want to focus your time. But I right. think there, there's definitely some merit to that that idea of once we have these scores, how can we use them to pick things <laughs> right. and be sure in our choices? Yeah. Well, hopefully there'll be many such committees in the future. Uh, <laughs> Fingers crossed. You might be sitting on some of the boards yourself, uh, but um, yeah, yeah. Look, just uh, how close are you to your PhD? Are you a couple so, years out? I am starting my third year, I guess a month in at this point. Uh, Hoping to be done in under two more, but that would be fast, so we'll see. Ah. Uh, and my PhD thesis is going to be in SETI, and then I plan to do postdocs in the subject as well. Awesome. So, Well, good luck to you. I, I look forward to seeing your, your thesis in a, in a year or two. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to thank Sophia Shake for being on the Wow Signal, and remember, remember that name, Sophia Shake. I'm pretty sure we'll see more good work from her, and maybe have her back on the podcast in the not too distant future. She's representative of our initiative to try to speak to as many young scientists as we can, in addition to established scientists. And she's not our first, but she is, and not even our youngest, but. Uh, she's in that category. And I think that uh, in two or three years, Dr. Shake will have even more to share with us. So uh, thank you. And I hope that this will now establish at least, or be the opening round in establishing a framework under which proposed techno signature searches are evaluated. And the intent here is to give voice to all the particular pluses and minuses that a particular search might have. And that's a good thing. The, the amount of funding, as you probably know, for SETI is still very small. Breakthrough Listen was a big step forward, but it was for us essentially a single well, really two projects, a radio and an optical search. But there, I hope, will be more funding in the future, and that funding should be awarded in accordance with a well-thought-out set of criteria, which I think this paper represents a good first cut at. And no doubt the community will bang away at it for quite some time, but She's put it out there, and now there can be more work done. Now, I have to say, there have been a lot of good papers lately, not only in the SETI area, but in other areas that this podcast covers, and we just have not kept up, and we are going to try to do that. I'm going to be looking for new team members who want to help me keep up with particularly SETI and astrobiology, but also space exploration. Now, there are other podcasts that do a really good job talking about rockets and planets. but So I want to go a little bit outside that, a little bit further, push it more, and talk about some of the other things.
things that uh, are perhaps a bit more abstract and also a bit more future focused, far farther out than just what Elon Musk is going to do next year, which I think is, by the way, very interesting, but not our niche. So please, uh, if you're interested in getting into podcasting, but you don't want to start your own podcast, contact us, email wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com. We'll be happy to talk to you. If you can produce a few hours of good quality audio per year, then you're the right person. It doesn't have to be every month. It just has to be enough content that we can keep going. And I, I could see adding two or three team members. The other folks on the team have been extremely busy with their lives and work and just have not been able to get much content out. It's not their fault. I know they want to. They just haven't been able to. So let's let's keep moving in that direction. And there is a lot of stuff to cover. I will do my best to cover what I can. And as Sophia mentioned, there are people she's gotten a lot of good information from. I want to talk to some of those people as well. So, and if you have any ideas who I should talk to, by all means, either email wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com or you can contact us on Twitter at Podcast Wow, at Podcast Wow, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, respond to you there. And if you want to support this podcast, we're on Patreon. The links again are at wowsignalpodcast.com. All the information you possibly could want about this episode and all the other episodes that we've done. And we've done close to 70, probably actually a bit over 70 total episodes and bursts are out there. It's all good stuff. Even the old, even the oldest episodes have all kinds of great things in them. So by all means, please check out wowsignalpodcast.com. And you can, there you can download any of the old episodes all our episodes are free to listen to. If you want to help support us, we're at patreon.com slash wowsignal. And there we will accept any size donation. And we only bill our patrons when we put out a full-length episode like this one. The, the bursts are not billed. So you're not taking any risk. You're not giving us a monthly amount of money. You're just saying... Uh, when you put out a full-length episode, I will provide a small amount of cash. A uh, dollar, two dollars, five dollars, a thousand dollars? Yeah, why not? Uh, yeah, a thousand dollars is actually the preferred amount. And actually, if you did that, I would either collectively or individually, I would quit my day job and do this full-time in a heartbeat. Well, one can dream, right? Anyway, so... Go to wowsignalpodcast.com for more information. The music on today's podcast was written by DJ Spooky, Jason Robinson, and Erica Lloyd, all music used with permission of the artist. This has been The Wow Signal, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information. All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons or is presented with the permission of the artist. The Wow Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License.